welcome to another Lewisburg Community TV video. This is episode 21 and we are happy to be back in the shop. We opened on Tuesday, so it's so nice to have proper customers, real customers, as opposed to online customers. And yeah, so here we are back and we're going to be showing you a video we did some time ago with a bookshop in Lebanon and that's coming up in a moment. But Neil, you're just going to talk about some book club stuff and a book you're reading? Yeah, the, the, I've just started reading The Best Land Under Heaven uh, by Michael Wallace and it's about the American um, settlers that went over to the West uh, across the Indian territory and uh, it's fascinating because I mean these guys thought that they had a right to the land and uh, it's a history book but it's just got a really interesting and it kind of ties in quite nicely with our book club which we've just finished and uh, we're having a meeting today. They're there by Tommy Orange, who's uh, a Native American writer, and he's writing about the, the problems that these, these days that the Native Americans have in America. So it kind of ties in with this book because basically they, they hadn't really recovered from, from the, having their land stolen by these guys who thought that they had every right to take the land from these guys. It's just fascinating to see that 150 years later that things haven't changed for the Native Americans. So I'm kind of interested in that side of American history at the moment. So, yeah, really fascinating. And yeah, brief. and I suppose my topic at the moment is swimming. <laughs> um, we have so many people coming into the shop who swim. Oh, who people swimming. love swimming, wild swimming. It was on the Sunday Miscellany this morning about swimming. It's become the thing, hasn't it, really, in Ireland. And two books we've had, um, which are which are really interesting by the sea. It's the therapeutic benefits of being in, on, and by the water. Now it's actually a gorgeous book for a Christmas present. So it it talks about all sorts of side of the water, about studies done in Japan, about um, the physical benefits of the sea, um, animal assisted therapy. Also, it's actually a gorgeous book. Yeah, we sold quite a few of those, and these we've sold too. It's about why we swim. And it shows every time we order them, we sell out, and then I try to order them again. It's not that easy to get the books because everyone's buying them. So just a book about why we swim. Again, some Bye, of what's in there. Bonnie, I don't know how to say it, Sue, Sue Sai. And yeah, that this is, you know, a theoretical book about why we swim, but it's fascinating. And then this is a book uh, at Swim Three Birds, which um, I assisted two of my friends with this book. It was when we ourselves started swimming about five years ago. Jane is a painter and Maggie is a poet and this story, this book really is about the story of what happened, why we started swimming and what happens, the transformative effects of water and it features um, some beautiful paintings by Jane and amazing poems by Maggie and there's one or two things in there from me as well. So that's swimming books and then also just an interesting one that's come in, this self-help classic the Game of Life and How to Play It. It was originally published in the 1920s and it has some, some um, I suppose, uh, universal truths in there that hasn't changed since the 20s and it's been reissued and it's a gorgeous book. Again, a lovely, a lovely produced book to give Great for Christmas. present yeah. for Christmas. So yeah. uh, so we're kind of reading those kind of books at the moment. So I think we'll go over to, to Neve and Elias' book. So, you will find out what happened on on the video, but essentially their bookshop was closed or more more or less destroyed in August with the explosion that happened yeah, in Beirut. Terrible. And we made contact with them. Neve has an Irish, but well, she is Irish, and you know opened that bookshop in Lebanon. So we we had an interview with her and just I suppose for moral support and just to to hear some of the challenges that that she has faced opening the bookshop in the first place and then now having to reopen it. So we'll go over to Neve. Hello, <laughs> and we've got Neve Fleming Farrell, originally from County Leash on, I was going to say on the line with us, but here in Tertulia TV on Zoom with us. So Neve comes, comes to us today from Beirut. We all know what happened with the explosion in Beirut recently, and we made contact with Neve's bookshop, Elias Books. And today we're just going to talk about the bookshop and what's happening over there. And just for us, I suppose it's nice to, to go outside of Ireland and see what's happening. I think we've become very introverted recently with COVID and everything that's happening. It's all about us and, and what's going on. So it would be so nice to hear um, from Neve what's going on over there. So maybe I'll, we'll just pass over to Neve and just tell us, I suppose, how you ended up in Beirut. That's fascinating mm -hmm. us as well in a bookshop. <laughs> um, 
I ended up here because I got offered a job in Beirut um, in 2009, right? As um, I was finishing university and obviously Ireland was in the middle of, of its own economic crisis. And I was just applying for jobs left, right and center. And I applied for one which was advertised as abroad and abroad turned out to be Beirut. And I took it and I thought, I'll go for a year and then I'll come home. Um, and one year sort of stretched and became two and three and four. Um, and I did various different things here. Um, and then I moved to Dubai for a year, really didn't like that. So I came back to Beirut. And then a friend and I were chatting one night and said, wouldn't it be fun to, to have a bookshop in Beirut? And I guess we happened to have the savings and the ability to start it. And we didn't really know what we were doing, but we did it and it grew. Um, so a year later, we expanded to include a, a coffee shop and a, a bar as well. And yeah, and that's kind of what we were doing, trying to do as Lebanon plunged into its own economic recession. Um, I guess a decade after the first one that brought me here. Yeah, I know, because we, we've seen the pictures, obviously, and it just looks amazing. I know we thought, oh, it just yeah, looks oh, like, it's a, like a dream like bookshop. Like a fabulous bookshop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ours is, I mean, we love our bookshop too, but it's quite small. We, we, we don't have capacity for a bar or, you know, yet, yet. Or anything like that. So, um, yeah. So how, what's it been like, though? Because, what, I, mean, I suppose, you, what kind of books have you been selling in the bookshop? Who, who, who were your customers? So we started all um, really selling the things we liked. So we, the reason it's called Alias is because the night we, we started talking about how fun it would be to have a bookshop in Beirut, um, we were actually discussing a book called An Unnecessary Woman by a Lebanese writer, Rabia al -Madine. And it's a really good book. This is about a 72-year-old Lebanese woman who lives on her own. And she works in a bookshop in Beirut and she translates one text a year into Arabic. And this is kind of her life. And then various things happen, which means she has to interact with other humans. It's, it's a really, really, really good book. I really like it. And her name is Alia. So when we needed a name, that seemed sort of the obvious choice. Um, and we sort of started from there. We knew we wanted a good selection of um, Lebanese and Arabic literature in English. And then we wanted fiction, which is mainly what, what I read and mainly what my original business partner reads. Um, and we wanted, we started with what we liked, then things we felt we should have read, but hadn't. Uh, and then some things that we thought other people would like. Um, and we also added a secondhand section too. So that, that's quite a, a random eclectic bunch of things that come our way. Um, and that's, that's kind of it. Like our, the number of titles we stock is pretty, pretty small. Um, it's not so easy to get books in Beirut. Like when you place an order, it takes three to four weeks in a good time, not after your port's been exploded, for the books to actually arrive. So it's quite slow. They're quite expensive. Um, the margin that we make on book sales is, is much smaller. Like it's, it's difficult, I think, in the book industry in the UK and Ireland anyway, but the margin we make is much smaller because the shipping and the import cuts into it. So realistically, we needed, the, like we needed coffee to sustain us because we needed something with a, with a, bit, more, a bit more scope for, for profit so we could pay the rent. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we do. Our customers initially, when we first proposed the idea of like a small English language bookstore, um, some people we knew here said, you're crazy. People in Lebanon don't read. Um, and that just isn't true. Mm -hmm. We've discovered very, very quickly is there is a big community of people who are looking for things to read and really enjoy it. And some really, really enthusiastic um, English, um, students at university who, who kind of came to us really quickly. Um, and then just other people passing through, people traveling, people who want to pick up something linked to the country. And as well as that, you, we get people who just want to be around books. You know, they like the idea of coming into a space where, where there are books 
and maybe you know they're not going to buy anything but they they want to pick one up and have a look at it while they're drinking coffee and and that's fine and that it's, it's really nice to be able to offer that yeah we know about that yeah we have a similar thing here yeah we do actually yeah i didn't think of it quite like that before but it is like that isn't it yeah. people do like the space and yeah that's why we have coffee too for that reason it's, it's a limited you know we've a limited space for the coffee but we find that too does work definitely mm. um wow and then of course we we know with the explosion that that your bookshop was more or less well destroyed and just was just tell us how what happened from then on and, and where you're at now i suppose with it um yeah it was <laughs> so it was it was yeah it was it was a big mess um it was fairly badly damaged i think one of the nice things we realized as people sort of started to clear up the debris was that actually there was more salvageable than we initially thought which was great, you know? Um, so that started to feel a little bit better as we went along. Uh, it was, was also amazing, like, the number of, of customers and friends who just showed up and said, what can we do, you know? Um, and, but that happened all over Beirut with, with every business and with, with people's homes and things. Like, it was, a, I've never seen anything like the mobilization of just the public to help each other. Um, after this this huge huge disaster it's still quite like when you walk the streets around us the damage is still very very visible like it's and, and quite arresting still uh, but slowly slowly we're getting back to to some semblance of normal and some some businesses have begun to reopen now um i don't know what else to to kind of say about that like it was all <laughs> like and going through the books afterwards you know because some of them the second hand section was fairly all right because they were on fixed shelves on the back wall which didn't come over but a lot of the new books were on shelves that just toppled um so they all ended up on the floor with glass everywhere and going through those book by book and trying to dust them out and trying to see what, what could you manage to salvage and what really had to be um, put aside uh, was, was difficult to do. And they're still, like, we're still finding, I had a, a friend who bought a stack and she went through them with a paintbrush and then showed me how much, how much debris still came out of them. It was quite, quite impressive. But we, we had a stamp made with the, our Alias Books logo and the date the 4th of, of August on it and all of those damaged books are, are stamped so I didn't want to carry some bit of history in them I suppose um, <laughs> yeah. and you hear this we're saying about things like they're repairing but they want to keep things um, some of the damage so I think what what we'll do at the moment is our bar top has been like quite pockmarked by the glass and I think I'll just varnish over it. I won't sand it down. And you keep little bits that sort of say, pay attention to what your government is up to. <laughs> Question why there are certain ships parked in certain places. Um, and yeah, it's it's a real you know, reminder. To, yeah. To, yeah. And, and how, is, how is the mood then, I suppose, from, from that point, how is the mood of the people then in, in Beirut at the moment, at, you know, post, post that? How are, I know everybody's probably still recovering, like you say, but how has the mood changed? Or people, have they changed in, in the way they're thinking? Um, I think like, something has shifted. I, I feel like for a lot of people, like this was really the last straw, you know? Like they will tell you that, the Lebanese are resilient. They've survived everything. They make things work even when there's no, and part of, you know, part of the reason there were people on the streets helping was that people are so used to having to fill in where the state is absent. Um, but this time, like Lebanon's been having a really tough year. Um, it's, it's a huge currency crisis, which has made everything really expensive and, and unaffordable for the majority of the population. There's, the coronavirus pandemic which closed the country down for several weeks and exacerbated that crisis um now there's like a political vacuum because the government has resigned again which is 
unfortunately a, a very regular occurrence here. Um, and, and I think people, when this explosion happened, they were just like, that's the last straw. And they're, you know, they say, we don't want to be described as res being resilient anymore. We don't want to be, why should we have to be resilient? Um, so there is, there is that narrative that's kind of jumped up. A lot of people have left. Um, anyone with an option to leave the country, as far as I know, you know, from the anecdotal evidence I have, has taken that option. And lots of other people are looking for their roots out, especially people with young families and children. Like their feeling is, like, we want to go somewhere where we can provide a future and safety and where our children don't suffer what we suffered, just building something and then watching it being destroyed. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a lot of this kind of talk and narrative and sadness and upset. And then on top of that, like, with an explosion of this magnitude, like it affected like, everybody, you know, and even, you know, people who weren't in Beirut, like everybody had family or somebody connected. And the shock um, and sort of, you know, the processing of, of that scale um, and the experience of it and the worry and the panic, I think is, is also it's taking its toll. People are moving through it, you know, people are reacting in different ways. So I think it's a struggle, but then at the same time, you also see a lot of um, just initiative being taken, uh, resilience, despite the fact that people don't want to be resilient. <laughs> They're picking up and getting on and looking for ways to, to work through this and to find better ways of, of existing and, and dealing with things. And, and I, I think they'll continue to do to do that and hopefully like i really hope that this is the turning point um yeah. for everyone and that like you lay the foundations now for something much better in the future but it's it's really difficult i mean i don't think uh it's made me very very appreciative of the type of um states we have built in in europe um and the yeah it's it it's, That's really sad, it's, yeah. it's, it's true is that we we take Ireland particularly for granted actually mm. truthfully we really do um I mean times are tough here as well but nothing like nothing like what you're going through there no, no nothing like that not at all um I know I know our, our thoughts are with you and like you said you're you're doing your own bit for that you're hoping to open the shop in the next few weeks so, you know, we look forward to hearing more about the shop when, when you're, I mean, you said this bit, there's building work going on at the moment. You are obviously in the middle of that now. Yeah. So, yeah, we're in the middle of all the, the reconstruction work. Um, we have doors back on at the moment, windows, the glass, the, the frames are in, the glass isn't yet. So that should go in, in the next couple of days. Um, you know, we should be back in action, which means we can also retain our staff and, and keep like keep our like it's a very 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 small contribution to the economy that we make but we really want to keep making it you know um, and and I think that's you know that's it's important to us and like when you can control nothing on the bigger picture like we have so little control in relation to the pandemic or the economic crisis we have to control the tiny, tiny spot left to us, which is our own thing. And, and we will try and do that and do it as best we can. Um, which I imagine is exactly what, what you, were guys, you were trying to do in Westport as well. Yeah, I guess it's true for all of us too. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we are doing that. But at the same time, you know, we, we, we want to feel we're contributing to the bigger picture. Like you said, it doesn't matter how small, we, all contribution makes up the whole, doesn't it? So it's important that we all do that. It definitely is. Yeah. And I, I suppose we, we, we'd love to tune in again with you in a few more weeks, maybe when you're open and we could have a little tour of the shop and talk some more about what you're doing. Yeah. It'd be great. It'd be really, really nice to, um, to do that. And I can bring, I'll bring you downstairs and show you around. <laughs> well, well, hopefully next year, if things go to plan, we'll pop over and see you. We'd love to come to the <laughs> roof, yeah, at some stage. Yeah, yeah, definitely, when, when definitely. I definitely will be in Westport the next time I'm in Ireland and my mother will 
there will be too. She's very, very impressed with you. She's been watching. Oh, uh, okay. So we, we'll say goodbye for now and wish you the best of luck. Yeah, lovely to see you. Bye. Thank bye, -bye. You. The pictures that we have of the bookshop now as it's opened and it just looks amazing. And yeah. it's just the bookshop we and we wish them. To. We wish them good luck. Uh, just opened this week and, uh, you know, just in time for Christmas. Because there's plenty of Christians in uh, Lebanon, so I'm sure they're going to celebrate in that shop. Yeah, so we we'll, we'll finish out with Neve and the picture of her gorgeous bookshop has opened. And we say thank you to all our customers for coming back into us. And we are offering shopping slots, so from nine in the morning and until seven, people can come in and have the shop to themselves. And we did have a family came in yesterday. They were here for about an hour and they just had a gorgeous time and it was lovely to have them. So. Happy Christmas everyone, Happy we Christmas. will talk to you again in the new year and we just go out with me. Thank you.